Chapter 63 goes over the nursing management of a patient with renal failure, and this would be acute and chronic. We're going to learn about dialysis, um, hemo, or peritoneal. Acute kidney injury, or they call it acute renal failure. The patho was sudden and almost complete loss of kidney function over a period of hours to days. This can be reversible if it is found and treated early in the disease process. Signs and symptoms include augurea, anurea, or it could have a normal volume of urine. Elevated BUN and creatinine with retention of other metabolic waste products called azotemia. And if you look on page 1377, Table 63.4, um, pre-renal, this results of impaired blood flow that will lead to hypoperfusion of the kidney. Some of the causes can be hypovolemia, sepsis, or even shock. Intrarenal causes damage to the glomeruli or the kidney tubes. Causes can be nephritis, nephrotoxic drugs, glomerulonephritis, and renal artery thrombosis. Post-renal, which is obstruction of the urine flow. Some of the causes can be bladder cancer, a stone, of course, and strictures. Health promotion and maintenance. Uh, always avoid dehydration, so you would need to ask your client to drink two to three liters of fluids daily if they are not on some type of fluid restriction. Weigh the patient the same time and on the same scales. Blood volume depletion, assess their urine output, assess for postural hypotension and elevated uh, pulse. Monitor lab values such as specific gravity, serum creatinine, electrolytes, and your BUN. And you would want to question any nephrotoxic drugs. And remember the handout that I gave you, the amino glycosides, that is odo and nephrotoxic. So any drugs that are nephrotoxic, you would not want your patient to take. And if you look on page 1377, table 635, those goes over some of the nephrotoxic drugs. If a patient must receive nephrotoxic drugs, you always want to monitor their peak and trough levels and BUN and their creatinine. Fluid permitted each day, drink an amount equal to urine output plus 700 milliliters. Early recognition and correction of these problems causing reduced urinary elimination may avoid kidney tissue damage. So always be on the lookout for signs and symptoms of kidney dysfunction with your assessment skills. Health promotion and maintenance. Avoid dehydration, so you should instruct the client to drink at least two to three liters of fluids daily. Weigh the patient at the same time and on the same scales if possible. Blood volume depletion, assess urine output, postural hypertension, and tachycardia. Monitor lab values such as specific gravity, serum creatinine, electrolytes, and their BUN. And you want to question any nephrotoxic drugs. And remember the handout that amino glycosides is odo and nephrotoxic. So if you've already got some kidney issues, you gotta be real careful about giving them uh, nephrotoxic drugs. And if you look on page 1393, 1393, this will go over some of the drugs Excuse me, I think I got the wrong assessment. Recognize cues. Always ask about the history, the history of the patient. Ask the patient about recent surgeries or trauma they have had, any transfusions or other factors that might lead to reduced renal blood flow. Obtain a complete drug history 
That means over the counter, along with what is subscribed by the physician, especially treatment with antibiotics, ACE inhibitors, or NSAIDs, imaging studies, procedures requiring injection of contrast dye, do they have diabetes or long-term hypertension because these can lead to acute uh, kidney failure, to identify possible acute glomerulonephritis, ask about acute illnesses such as emphysema, colds, gastroenteritis, and sore throats. Urine color has become darker or appears smoky. Reversible pre-renal azotemia, and that's just a buildup of, of that nitrogen waste, may occur after any episode of acute hypotension. Hemorrhage or shock, burns, heart failure, or any problems in which the blood volume is depleted, extensive bowel preparations, NPO status before surgery, and fluid loss during surgery can cause pre-renal azotemia in some patients, difficulty in starting the urine stream, changes in the amount or the appearance of the urine, nocturia if they've got to get up at night and go to the bathroom, urgencies or symptoms of renal stones, ask about any cancer history that may, that may cause urinary obstruction, physical assessment and clinical manifestations, the signs and symptoms of acute renal failure are related to the buildup of nitrogen waste, azotemia, as well as the underlying cause. Signs and symptoms of pre-renal azotemia are hypotension, tachycardia, decreased urine output, decreased cardiac output, and lethargic. Intrarenal Acute renal failure usually occurs with damage to the glomerulus, intracitual tissues, or in the tubes. Signs and symptoms are related to retention of fluid and nitrogen waste. These include augurea, which just a decrease in urine output, or anurea, the A, absent of urine, edema, hypertension, tachycardia, shortness of breath, distended neck veins, weight gain, respiratory crackles, anorexia, nausea and vomiting, lethargic, or any changes of level of consciousness, elevated potassium levels and low calcium levels, such as electro cardiographic changes, because you might change what your ECG is, has been saying, may also be present. Post-renal failure, monitor for decreased urine output, intermittent an anuria, symptoms of urea, uremia, and lethargic. Report changes in the urinary system or difficulty starting. So you will need to teach them if anything out of the ordinary is going on with their urinary system, they need to report it ASAP. Cause it, soon, cause it the quicker that we can find out what's going on and correct it, that won't harm their kidneys. Lab rising BUN and serum creatinine and abnormal blood electrolyte values, and if you look on page 1379, this goes over the kidney disease for laboratory uh, uh, profiles, so make sure that you look at these tests, what the normal ranges are, and then you've got values in kidney disease, so make sure that you look over that chart. Imaging studies that will be done, x-rays can show size of kidney and stone obstruction because there's a stone or we can go in and get it. Renal ultrasound will show urinary tract obstruction. CT without contrast can show obstructions or tumors. Cystoscopy or retrograde pyelograph can show obstructions of the lower urinary tract. Then a renal biopsy might be done 
if the cause of the acute renal failure is unknown. Treatment. The primary goal of treatment for acute renal failure is to prevent further damage, of course. Supportive measures aim to control symptoms and to prevent complications. These patients are on a lot of medications. You need to be aware where the drug is metabolized. Diuretics are given to increase urine output. You may have to give boluses of normal saline. Lasix may be ordered. And remember, Lasix is a loop diuretic. It acts on the ascending loop of Henle to inhibit chloride transport of sodium into the circulation and inhibit passive reabsorption of sodium. Sodium and water are lost together with potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Loop diuretics can affect blood glucose and can increase uric acid levels. Drugs in this group are extremely potent and cause marked depletion of water and electrolytes. So before you actually give Lasix, you need to always monitor their potassium and what their electro, uh, electrolytes are, because if they've got a very low potassium, you might not want to give that uh, Lasix, and you might want to notify the physician because all it's going to do is further deplete it. The most common side effects of loop diuretics or Lasix are fluid and electrolyte imbalances such as hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, and hypomagnesium. So you would need to monitor their electrolytes. Be careful to assess urine output. If the kidneys are not responding to treatment, you may have to discontinue them. And always assess for fluid overload. Always talk to the nurse that if they're having to go to dialysis on what medications that you as a nurse might need to hold before they go to dialysis. Um, nutritional therapy, if you have a good dietary intake, you may need no counseling. A dietary consult may be needed to calculate the caloric needs, such as how much protein, potassium, and sodium is needed in the diet. Most renal patients are very sick people. They may need some type of supplement, such as TPN. And remember that TPN is mixed in the pharmacy and is ordered specifically for the patient. Because what they look at, they look at what's going on with your patient, their lab values, and then they will order whatever they need to have supplemented in the TPN. Kidney specific oral supplements such as Nepro or Renacal can be uh, consumed. Dialysis therapies are used when the kidneys are not functioning correctly with fluid volume excess, elevated potassium levels, or metabolic acidosis. The doctor will insert a vascular access, which can be a dual or triple lumen. Sites they may be used are like the subclavian, internal jugular vein, or femoral sites. And if you'll look on page 1397, um, excuse me, 1382, 1382, this is just some of the uh, catheters that might be used. And I will show these in class. Chronic kidney disease. You've got two handouts there that we will go over in class. Chronic renal failure or end-stage renal disease is a progressive, irreversible decline in renal function. It may be caused by systemic diseases such as diabetes mellitus, pyelonephritis, glomerulonephritis, or environmental agents. Kidney dysfunction, you will have azotemia, 
And remember, this is just buildup of nitrogen-based waste in the blood, uremia, azotemia with clinical symptoms. And if you'll look on page 1383, this gives the key features of uremia. You will have elevated respiratory rate and uremic syndrome, which is a condition characterized by destruction of red blood cells and kidney failure. Any planned tooth extractions need prophylactic antibiotic before any dental procedures. All right, stages of chronic renal failure. You have diminished renal reserve. This is where you have your, your renal function is very reduced. Your other kidney may be compensating for that kidney that's not functioning properly. Renal insufficiency. Uh, your nephrons can no longer compensate. Uh, treatment is medical. And then you've got the end stage renal disease. This is where you're going to have to have a dialysis. Chronic kidney disease changes. Kidney changes, you will have a reduced glomerular filtration rate, which causes many problems, including abnormal urine production, poor water excretion, electrolyte imbalances, and metabolic abnormalities. The kidneys can maintain an effective GFR due to the healthy nephrons working harder. Homeostasis is maintained until later in the course of the kidney failure. The BUN increases and urine output will decrease. When kidney function declines to this level, the patient is at risk for fluid overload. Metabolic changes. Early in CKD, the patient is at risk for hyponatremia, which is low uh, sodium, because there are fewer healthy nephrons to reabsorb sodium so sodium is lost in the urine. Then in later stages of CKD, kidney excretes less sodium as urine production decreases. Then sodium retention is high and your sodium levels are increased can occur with only modest increases in dietary sodium intake. This problem leads to severe fluid and electrolyte imbalances your blood pressure is going to go up. You're going to have edema. Normal serum potassium levels are 3.5 to 5, and they are maintained until the 24-hour urine output falls between 500, below 500. High potassium levels then develop very quickly, reaching 7 to 8 or greater. Then you will have severe ECG changes and dysrhythmias. Acid base balances is affected by CKD. First, your blood pH changes just a little bit due to the remaining healthy nephrons increase their rate of acid secretion or excretion. Then as more nephrons are lost, acid excretion is reduced and metabolic acidosis results. Then as CKD gets worse, the patient will develop cool, small breathing, which is a deep labored breathing pattern often associated with severe metabolic acidosis. It is a form of hyperventilation, which is any breathing pattern that reduces carbon dioxide in the blood due to increased rate or depth of respirations. Calcium and phosphorus changes. In CKD, there is a retention of phosphorus and a decrease of vitamin D, which will disrupt the calcium phosphorus balance. And I gave you a handout. So if you will look at it, you will see where if the calcium goes up, your phosphorus is going to go down. Then if your calcium goes down, your phosphorus is going to it's going to go up. So that's kind of like a seesaw. And that always happens with your calcium phosphorus relationship. Hypertension can be the cause 
of CKD or a result of and will cause damage to the kidneys if it is not resolved. End stage renal disease then occurs. When you have CKD, you will have an overload of sodium and fluid due to the dysfunction of your renin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. People with CKD usually have heart damage or their heart is enlarged. Hyperlipidemia is from the changes in the fat metabolism that will cause your triglycerides, your total cholesterol, and low density lipoprotein levels to increase, which will lead to arteriosclerosis. Heart failure is due to the increased workload of the heart due to being anemic, having elevated BP, and fluid volume overload. Your left ventricular will also enlarge. Pericarditis, the uremic toxins, and infection causes inflammation of your pericardial sac. Some signs and symptoms, you'll have chest pain, low-grade fever, and elevated pulse. Pericardial, pericardial infusion will result if in untreated, and this is just accumulation of excess fluid around your heart. The blood pressure will decrease and the patient will have shortness of breath, and the treatment is to remove that fluid. Hematologic changes, anemia is the ma major sign and symptom, and this is due to the decrease of your erythropoietin, and this will cause a decrease in your RBCs. Gastrointestinal changes, signs and symptoms of uremia or halitosis, which is just bad breath, stomatitis, anorexia, nausea and vomiting, or even hiccups can occur. All right, patient-centered collaborative care. As we say on every disorder, you always have to collect a thorough history, such as age, gender, weight, existing kidney disease or problems, drug use, over-the-counter, illicit, or prescribed, any kidney stones, drugs, prescription, or over-the-counter, uh, dietary habits, weakness, do they have bruising or bleeding, and this could be from the uremic state, appearance of the urine, what it looks like, what it smells like, and any other difficulty. Physical assessment, recognizing those cues. The biggest physical change are related to your fluid volume and your electrolyte imbalances and acid base balance. All right, then you've got to go over, look at page 1388. This will go over key features. All right, we've got uh, <coughs> neurologic, assess for lethargic to coma, assess for sensory changes such, such as peripheral neuropathy or uremic neuropathy, assess for fatigue, how tired the patient gets, cardiovascular hypertension, heart failure, pericarditis, dysrhythmias, listen for those extra sounds uh, measure blood pressure in each arm unless you have a port for dialysis in one of them. Respiratory, assess the patient's breath for odors. It may smell like urine, which is uremic halitosis. Do they yawn a lot? Shortness of breath, assess the rate of their respiratory. Hematologic, assess for anemia. Are they tired? Are they pale looking or weak? Check for bleeding, bruising, nose or gum bleeds. Assess for their stools for uh, bleeding, like tarry stools. GI, foul breath or mouth inflammation, abdominal pain, vomiting. Check for blood in the stool for occult blood. Skeletal osteodystrophy. For poor absorption of calcium, do they have fragile bones, which they fracture easy? Assess their gait, 
may bend over more due to vertebral becoming more compact. Ask about changes in their weight and any bone pain. Observe for spinal curvatures. The urinary, assess the urine for amount voided, appearance, odor. Skin, assess for uremia, which would be pigment deposited in the skin causing a yellow color or from, for dark skin people, the skin becomes more darker. They may have puritis, which is itching, uremic frost, urea crystals from sweat, may bruise easy or have purple patches. Psychosocial assessment need to make sure the patient understands the disease process, their drug treatment, diet therapy, assess for anxiety and their coping strategies. Laboratory uh, assessments, you would want to monitor their BUN, their sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphate, and their H&H. &H. The doctor will order a UA or he may order a 24-hour urine. Imaging assessments, x-ray will show renal osteodystrophy of the hand. And remember, this is just a bone disease that occurs when your kidneys fail to, prop to maintain the proper levels of calcium and phosphorus in the blood. Your kidneys will get smaller. The doctor may order a CT scan without contrast because that contrast could further damage your kidneys. And this is just a picture of osteodystrophy. And remember, this is just the, uh, a bone disorder that comes from poor absorption of your calcium. Excess fluid volume, daily weights, and you would want to use the same scales, the same time of day, the same clothes, and after they have voided, because that way you will get an accurate weight. Way before and after dialysis may have to be placed on fluid restriction. Estimate the amount of fluid retained. Always use this, one kilogram of weight equals about one liter of fluid retention. Potential for pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema, your patient will be restless. They'll have an increased pulse, shortness of breath, crackles, and anxiety. Your, you will always monitor serum electrolyte levels, vital signs, O2 sats, and hypertension, of course. And you will be given Lasix. This is used to help manage pulmonary edema. And these drugs are given continuously IV route due to ototoxicity. You'll be given morphine can be ordered to help with oxygen demand, but remember to assess the respiratory status. Nitroglycerin can be ordered to help dilate those blood vessels. It is a nitrate and were the first agents to use to relieve angina. Uh, this can, drug can be given sublingual, topical, oral, extended capsules or tablets, or IV. Remember from the previous slide, Lasix is a loop diuretic. Uh, you will be have to make sure that you monitor your uh, potassium levels and your electrolytes very careful when you're given uh, Lasix. Increase in cardiac function. Some of the interventions. Most of your renal patients are on several blood pressure medicines, so always check with the nurse that's going to be giving the dialysis to your patients and talk with them about the medications and if they want you to hold those blood pressure meds. Controlling the blood pressure is a must with the patient with kidney issues, diuretics will be ordered, uh, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, alpha and beta adenergic blockers. 
uh, vasodilators will be ordered. So instruct patient and family to monitor blood pressures, weigh that patient, what kind of diet they are supposed to be on, and their drug, drug therapy. Increasing cardiac function. Sometimes the patient is on several blood pressure medicines. They could be on three or four to keep their blood pressures at a normal range. So just remember that. Always check with your nurse that is going to be giving the patients their dialysis. They may want you to hold their blood pressure medicines till they come back and then you would assess their blood pressure before you give that medication. Controlling the blood pressure is a must with patients with kidney issues. Diuretics, especially thiazides, will be ordered. Calcium channel blockers, these are used to treat stable and variant angina, certain dysrhythmias, and hypertension. They also dec decrease cardiac contractility, afterload, and per peripheral resistance, and they reduce the workload of the heart, which decreases the need for oxygen. This could be verapamil, your procardia, cardizem. Then you've got what they call ACE inhibitors. These are usually prescribed for heart failure. They dilate venules, arterioles, which improves renal blood flow and decrease blood fluid volume. They moderately decrease the release of the aldosterone, which in turn reduces sodium and fluid retention. You got the alpha, beta, adnergic blockers. This group of drugs blocks both the alpha and beta 1 receptors. Um, and I gave you a handout that has alpha 1, alpha 2 on it. So pull up that and look at which one blocks the heart, which one blocks the lung. Imbalanced nutrition. All right, the dietary restrictions are according to the severity of the patient's renal disease. A nutritionist will work with the, the client. Protein is restricted on the basis of the disease. If protein is lost in the urine, protein will be added to the diet that equals the loss. The patient has to have dialysis. They would need more protein because it is lost in the treatment. Make sure you know some protein-enriched foods. Sodium restriction is needed when the patient has no or little urine output. When the sodium and fluid is retained, you will have edema. You must weigh the patient and check their blood pressure. If your patient is on a fluid restriction diet, you must calculate every ounce of fluid they consume. Potassium restriction, you must teach your patient how to read labels. High potassium levels can cause cardiac problems, so make sure that you know some potassium uh, foods at what you would teach your patient not to eat. All right, phosphorus restriction is started early in CKD, is avoided to avoid the patient from contact, contracting osteodystrophy. Uh, phosphorus binders must be taken at meal times, and the patient will inform you that they know that they've got to take these phosphate binders along with every meal or snack. They will not eat because they know they've got to have this to survive on. So when your patient has an increased phosphorus level, which will have a low calcium level, need to take calcium acetate to bind with phosphorus via the GI tract. Let me say that again. If your patient has an increased phosphorus level, which they will have a decreased calcium level, 
The client will need to take calcium acetate to bind with phosphorus via the GI tract. So they will have to have those phosphorus binders. An example of those is your renal gel or FOSLO. They will have to have those for every meal and snack. Phosphorus binders reduce the absorption of phosphate as they cannot get rid of the phosphorus that get into their bloodstream. That's very important. Vitamin supplements, iron is needed due to the decreased production of erythropoietin. Calcium and vitamin D are needed. One thing to remember is the nutritional needs are different with patients receiving PD versus HD. The protein is lost in a patient receiving peritoneal dialysis, so you need to replace the protein. Usually a nutritionist will come to the patient's room and speak to them on these restrictions. Nutritional needs for patients undergoing PD are slightly different from those undergoing HD because protein is lost within the dialysate in the PD and replacing lost protein is a must. Your patients with dialysis that have to have dialysis, they are very sick people, so risk for infection is increased. So you've got to make sure that you monitor and assess their skin daily, prevent any skin issues, good hand washing, inspect that uh, vascular access daily, uh, monitor their vital signs that might show that they have an infection. Risk for injury, the patient has brittle, fragile bones that will fracture very easily. Make sure you use a draw sheet and don't pull on the patient because you can actually fracture a bone. Look on page 1391. This is some common drugs uh, that you would need to be aware of. First, your loop diuretics, your fluoroxamide, which is your Lasix, calcium acetate, uh, folic acid, your B12, ferrous sulfate, calcitrol, epodetin alpha. So make sure that you go over those drugs. Your patient is going to be very fatigued and tired, so you always want to assess their lab values, of course, their H&H. &H. Look at, are they deficient in any vitamins? And then you'll want to replace whatever vitamins they are deficient with. Um, administer erythropoietin therapy for bone marrow production and give iron supplements, of course. Um, some anxiety interventions. Um, it, it, it's going to be a collaborative effort on the tech the nurse, the doctors, the nurse practitioners to really take care of this patient and assess them. Patient and family education is very important because they're going to have to change their lifestyles. Um, encouragement of patient to ask questions and the family to ask questions. Teach them to write down the questions and then when the doctor comes in, they can go through their list. Because there's a lot of do's and don'ts that they're going to have to live with to be able to, to survive. Hemodialysis. Dialysis is used to remove fluid and uremic waste from the body when the kidneys are unable to do it the natural way. Acute dialysis is indicated when there's a rising potassium levels, fluid overload, acidosis, or confusion. Dialysis can also be used to remove toxin or medications from the blood. Chronic and maintenance dialysis is used when a person has end-stage renal disease. Their kidney can no longer function and they can, can be maintained on dialysis for years. It can be a 
financial burden as well as interfering with your ability to work and socialize. A kidney transplant can el eliminate the need for dialysis. Hemodialysis is the most common method, can be used for patients that are actually ill or long term. A dialysizer, and if you'll look on page 1396, this is what that is like your own, uh, every patient has their own uh, dialysizer. It is a semi-permeable membrane replacing the filter of the kidneys. Objective is to extract toxic nitro nitrogen substance from the blood, which is the waste. Then the blood is cleaned through the machine and put back into your patient. Treatment usually lasts anywhere from three to four hours. Um, diffusion, osmosis, and ultrafiltration are the principles. The toxins and waste are removed by diffusion. They move from higher to lower in the dialysate. The solutions is made up of important electrolytes. You can control a patient's status by adjusting the bath. Excess water is removed by osmosis area of higher solute to a lower solute. The higher the solute is the blood and the lower is the bath. Ultra filtration is defined as water moving from a higher to a lower. This helps remove the fluid the patient cannot excrete on their own. Heparin is placed in the port after dialysis to prevent clots. It remains active in your body for up to six hours after dialysis, so you are at risk for bleeding, so you will always need to assess for bleeding. The next two slides just goes over what a machine is, dialysis machine. This slide just shows where it's got the access device where the blood is coming out and it's going through the, the uh, semi-permeable membrane there where it's taking all that excess waste out and then it puts the blood back into the patient. And this is just another one that shows where the arm is there, where it's got your blood coming out and it's going through the actual uh, Artificial kidney there is what they call it, and then back into your body. And we've already looked at these, this slide in the book. Um, this goes over, this is what will actually be in, implanted into the patient so they can have a dialysis. Uh, they do have two different kinds. You've got a fistula, you've got a handout on this, you got a fistula or a graft. All right, the fistula directly connects an artery to a vein. The vein stretches over time and allows the needle to be put in. There's several advantages. This is permanent. It is beneath the skin. It lasts the longest up to 20 years. It provides a greater blood flow for better treatment, fewer infections and other complications. Um, disadvantages though, it usually cannot be used for at least six to eight weeks till it, it has healed. All right, a graft is a tube usually made of plastic that connects an artery to a vein allowing needles to be put in. Grafts are the second best way to get access to the bloodstream. Art advantages, it's permanent also. It's beneath the skin, uh, may be used after two weeks in some cases. Disadvantages, it is easily clotted. So they will have to go in and unclot that. So that's the difference of a fistula and a graft. All right, vascular access. Before hemodialysis can begin, 
access to the person's vascular system is established. They can have a single or double lumen catheter into the subclavian, interjugular, or femoral vein, which can have immediate access and can remain in place for several weeks. This access is removed when another type of device is inserted, such as your graft or your fistulas. All right, fistulas are more permanent surgically created by joining an artery and a vein. Needles are used to access the vessel and obtain blood flow. The fistula takes four to six weeks to mature to be ready to use. Graft use graft material to join the artery and vein, and this is used when patient vessel, vessels are not suitable for a fistula. They are usually located in the forearm, upper arm, or upper thigh. And if you look on page 1398, this will go over and show you some pictures there. All right, precautions, always check pulses before, below the site. Check for a brute, which is swishing sound, and a thrill, which you place your hand there and you'll feel the vibration. So a brute, you'll t place your stethoscope, you'll listen for that swishing sound, and a thrill for vibration, you can feel it. No blood pressures on the arm of the site. And if you look on page 1399, and this will go over caring for the patient with a arteriovenous fistula or an arteriovenous graft. So make sure that you go over that chart. Some complications, infections like MRSA or VRE, clotting or thrombosis is common with an AV graft arteriosclerotic heart disease, heart failure, PVD, anemia, chest pain, air embolism, or dysrhythmias, or hypotension can occur. If a patient develops headache, nausea and vomiting, restless, could be about to have a seizure, so you will want to give dilantin and that will help control that seizure. It can be given by mouth or IV. Intravenous infusion should be administered by direct injection into a large vein via central line or peripheral inserted catheter, which is your pick. The drug may be diluted in saline solution only. However, dextrose solution should be avoided because of drug precipitation, so only normal saline. The drug dosage is adjusted according to the therapeutic plasma or serum level. Dilantin has a narrow therapeutic range and your normal range should be 10 to 20. All right, the nursing care, as you're giving hemodialysis, as I have mentioned before, always check with the dialysis nurse before giving any medication due to a lot of the meds can be pulled off by dialysis. Always monitor their vital signs. Low blood pressure may mean that you need to give normal saline due to having too much fluid pulled off. Temperature may be elevated after dialysis due to warming of the blood, but if they have a fever, you need to suspect an infection and call MD for order for blood samples. Avoid invasive procedures four to six hours after dialysis due to heparin or citrate being given during the dialysis. Monitor patients one hour after dialysis for hemorrhage. And if you look on page 1400, this goes over caring for a patient undergoing hemodialysis. So look over and read that. And remember the patient may have a low grade temperature after dialysis. So just continue to monitor the temp. If it gets over 101, 
Notify the doctor immediately. Always monitor sodium levels also. Complications. The first one is dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. This is when there is a rapid decrease in fluid volume and BUN levels during dialysis. Patients will have nausea, vomiting, headaches. They, they'll just feel tired. Severe cases, they will have mental status changes and even a seizure may happen. And that's when you need to have that dilantin ready to give. Infectious disease, um, you'll have HIV, hepatitis B and C from blood transfusions, but that is less likely because they do monitor that very closely. Peritoneal dialysis. This is just a procedure that involves a rubber catheter placed into the abdominal cavity for infusion of dialysate. It is to remove toxic substances and metabolic waste to reestablish normal fluid and electrolyte balances. Treatment of chores for patients who are unwilling or unable to undergo hemo or transplant. Patients that are susceptible to rapid fluid changes that occur have fewer problems with peritoneal dialysis. If you look on page 1395, that table, that compares hemo to peritoneal dialysis. That is a very good table. There are several different types of peritoneal dialysis. And if you look on page 1402, that kind of goes over uh, some of them in 1403. <clears throat> Continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. This is performed at home to allow the patient to have reasonable freedom. It works under the same principle as diffusion and osmosis. Exchanges four to five times a day in a 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After the fluid is instilled, the bag can be tucked or stored or disconnected and count while it is indwelling. And what they mean by indwelling, that is the fluid is in your peritoneal cavity sitting there and getting all that waste absorbed. Freedom to move about, therefore not having to connect or disconnect, which puts the patient at risk for infection, contamination, or peritonitis. Longer dwell time, the better the clearance, drain fluid out by opening the bag lower than the abdominal cavity. There is no machine necessary. It is done by gravity. Continuous cyclic peritoneal dialysis. This is overnight intermittent peritoneal dialysis with a prolonged dwell time during the day. Connect to a cycler machine every evening and patient receives three to five two liter exchanges during the night. In AM, they cap off the tubing after infusing one to two liters of dialysate. Remains in the abdominal cavity until attached to the machine. They have a lower infection rate, fewer chances of contaminants uh, during the day. <clears throat> Automatic, automated peritoneal dialysis, they call this APD. And if you look on page 1403, this is a figure. This type of TPD can be done in the hospital, at a center, or at home. Program for the patient usually for 30 minutes. Dwell time, and then they so they have a certain amount of time that it inflows, and then it has a dwell time of sitting in the abdominal cavity and then the outflow for up to 10 hours a day. Intermittent peritoneal dialysis, not as effective as hemo, but it does promote a gradual change. Treatment of choice for unstable patients. Dialysate infused into the peritoneal cavity by gravity and then it's clamped. 
It is kept in the cavity for a certain amount of time known as the dwell time. The tube is unclamped and drains from the peritoneal cavity by gravity. Then the new container is infused. Maintaining cycle is the nurse's responsibility. You got to make sure that you have strict aseptics when changing the solution. Peritoneal dialysis. <clears throat> this is a procedure that involves a rubber catheter placed into the abdominal cavity for infusion of what they call dialysate. All right, there Peritoneal dialysis is where they remove toxic substances and metabolic waste and to reestablish normal fluid and electrolyte balance. Treatment of choice for patients who are unwilling or unable to undergo hemo or transplant. Patients that are susceptible to rapid fluid changes that occur have fewer Peritoneal dialysis, this is a procedure that involves a rubber catheter placed into the abdominal cavity for infusion of dialysate. It is to remove toxic substances and metabolic waste and to reestablish normal fluid and electrolyte balances. Treatment of choice for patients who are unwilling or unable to undergo hemo or transplants. Patients that are susceptible to rapid fluid changes that occur have fewer problems with peritoneal. Um, if you look on page 14, and this slide is just the picture of a patient that has <clears throat> continuous ambulatory peritoneal and remember, there's no machine necessary. It, it does it by gravity. You can see where it has the tube going into the peritoneal cavity. The dialysate is hung up. It goes into the peritoneal cavity, rinses it, it, you know, it uh, absorbs all that waste, and, and then it drains into uh, a bag. And this is just a picture of automated peritoneal dialysis. Uh, you can see this type of PD can be done anywhere, hospital, at the Dallas Center, or at home. It's programmed for the patient. Usually, um, they have a certain amount of time that the inflow goes in. It stays in for a certain amount of time in the abdominal cavity, peritoneal cavity, and then there's a certain amount of time that it flows back out. And this usually 10 hours at a time for this type of uh, data. And this picture here is just showing you um, where the catheter is placed in the peritoneal cavity. You can see the little uh, holes where the dialysate will go in and rinse and, and absorb all that waste. And then you see the drainage bag where it comes back out to. Complications of peritoneal dialysis, you could have infection, peritonitis, and that's just infl inflammation of your peritoneum. Most common and serious complication, this would be characterized by a cloudy dialysate. You will have diffuse abdominal pain, rebound tenderness, peritonitis that is unresolved after four days of treatment that catheter will have to be removed then. When they have pain, when the dialysate is first started, they may have pain, so you need to tell them that. This may last up to one or two weeks. Warm the solution, and this will help reduce the discomfort. Do not microwave, because you can have hot spots. Exit site and tunnel infections, you don't want no redness, you don't want no drainage or pain at the site. If you have a poor dialysate flow, this is usually due to constipation, so they may need a bowel prep, may order an enema before peritoneal dialysis, 
teach the client about a high fiber diet, stool softeners, always check tubings for kinks, uh, that would help. Dialysate leakage may occur immediately after insertion but generally stops if withheld for several days until the incision has healed. Bleeding may have a bloody drainage. Bleeding common for the first few, ex first few exchanges. One to two days, no specific interventions. Seen more often with obese or diabetic clients may need hemodialysis. Other complications, bleeding, observe the color of the outflow. If it is cloudy or color, cloudy in color, that indicates infection. So what you would need to do is collect a specimen and send to the lab so they can see what is growing, what kind of pathogen. All right, nursing care during peritoneal dialysis. Of course, you would want to always get a baseline vital signs. You'll want to weigh that patient, get laboratory tests. You'll want to monitor the patient for respiratory distress, pain and discomfort. Monitor the dwell time the doctor has ordered, which is the time that it should spend in the peritoneal cavity. And what does the outflow look like? Um, the nursing management, there are gonna be altered body images. So you need to tell the patient this. Their waist size will increase. Patient may feel fat no free time. You need to teach them all the do's and don'ts of peritoneal dialysis. Training usually takes five days to two weeks. You'll want to teach them to increase their dairy daily fiber. Constipation can impede the flow of dialysate. We already discussed about high fiber diets. They might need to have some kind of bowel preparation before. Many patients gain weight three to five pounds, limit carbs, aseptic technique to prevent infections, nutritional needs for patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis are slightly different from those undergoing hemodialysis. Protein is lost with a dialysate, so replacing lost protein is a must. renal transplantation. All right, this has become the treatment of choice for end-stage renal disease. It is a desire to avoid end-stage renal disease and dialysis. Must be free of any medical problems. Can be a living donor, a human cadaver, well-matched donors who are re related have a greater chance for success may have a nephrectomy of their own bad kidney before transplantation, or they can leave it in. The transplant is placed in the patient's iliac fossa anterior to the iliac crest. Pre-op, keep or get metabolic state as close to normal as possible and watch for signs of infection. Medical management, physical exam to treat and detect any condition that could cause problems, complete diagnostic tests, keep free of infection, psychosocial evaluation is conducted, hemodialysis is performed the day before the transplant, and the nursing management, you've got to do great pre-op teaching. Postoperative, Goal of care is to maintain homeostasis until the transplant kidney is functioning well. If your patient has a Foley calf, you will need to remove it as soon as possible to decrease a chance of infection. Rejection, this is the most serious complication. You can have acute tubular necrosis. This results in hypoxic damage when transplantation is delayed after the kidneys have been harvested. Thrombosis could occur for the first two to three days. Some other complication, you could see wound or kidney infection. If the patient puts out a large amount of urine, 
you need to assess their blood pressure. Immunosuppressive therapy, the patient will take rejection drugs for the rest of their life to prevent infection. <clears throat> you would need to monitor urinary function, address psychological concerns. You would need to monitor for any co complication, teach self-care about meds, watch a look for for rejection, decrease urine output, weight gain, malaise, fever, respiratory distress, and you need to teach them to keep all of their appointments and take their rejection medication. They've got to take that immunosuppressive therapy or their body is going to reject that kidney. 